good to come in contact with a little bit of power. Amen. And when you come in contact with him, you don't just get a little bit. You get every bit that you need. Because he is the baptizer of the Holy Ghost in fire. Amen. So I encourage you to come. What's going to happen? I have no idea. We're just going to get together. We're going to worship and we're going to find out together. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So come with an expectation. <clears throat> come energized. Come prayed up. Come ready. Uh, because this isn't just, you know, when Pastor Mark and Pastor Ron minister, or even when I fill in, or Pastor Belinda, or, or, or someone else like Laura did a couple Wednesdays ago. This isn't just our show. This is God's show. And this is called corporate worship. Uh, did y'all catch that? It's called corporate worship. Amen. So that means I can come up here and I could preach out of my mind and I could spit the word, but if y'all ain't connected and you ain't pulling, a whole lot of nothing's going to happen. Because it's corporate. Someone say corporate. corporate. Now, you know what happens during corporate worship? That means everyone's got to be involved. Everybody's got to be pulling. Everyone's got to be believing. Everybody's got to be ready to receive what God has for them. Because the minister can prepare. The minister can get ready. The minister can go wild and crazy. But if you're not pulling and not receiving, everything's going to fall flat. And so you're important when it comes to corporate worship. Thank you, hallelujah, for that one amen. (laughs) One person came ready for corporate worship this morning. I said, you're important to corporate worship. Amen. Amen. And so I need you all pulling this morning. I need you receiving from the word of God this morning the word that the Holy Ghost has for you. Amen. Amen. You do your part, I'll do my part. And guess what? God will do his part. Hallelujah. So I pray this morning that the simplicity of this message doesn't surpass you. You know, I've never been uh, well educated. Uh, That's not the education system's fault. That's more my fault. Hallelujah. School just wasn't my thing. Ditching school was my thing. (laughs) Hallelujah. And so, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) And so all you who love education, I need you to lay hands on me and pray for me. Because I get to read in a book, and about three pages in the book, I'm wondering about, like, aliens and stars and all this other stuff. And so education hasn't only been my strong suit, but at the same time, it's been my strong suit. Because God and his word is relatively simple. It doesn't take the most educated among us and the deepest thinker among us to receive his word and what he's done. It just takes somebody who's willing to believe his word and what he's done. And when we believe his word and believe what he's done, then we can receive from his word and receive what he's done. Amen? And so I want you to receive this morning. This morning we're going to be talking about trusting in God. Woo! I came revved up. Y'all ready? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. God is good. And we're going to get this word and it's going to bless us. You know what? I didn't even finish my coffee yet this morning, but we're charged up. Hallelujah. And so trusting in God is a vital part of what we are supposed to be doing as believers and Christians. Hallelujah. Because you'll realize that trust and faith, they go hand in hand. Amen. And you're not going to believe the word of God. You're not going to believe in the promises of God if you can't trust the individual that is delivering those to you. Hallelujah. And so we must first start with trust in him, and then that allows us to believe in him, which allows us to receive from him. Amen. And so everyone say, I trust in him. Isaiah 12, 2 says this. See, woo, glory to God. (laughs) Amen. We're going to run, we're going to shout, we're going to dance, because every service is a Holy Ghost service. Amen. Amen. Woo. (laughs) Isaiah 12, 2. See, God has come to save me. Let's just stop right there. First sentence, hallelujah. God has come to save me. I tell you what, stop looking at your situation and start looking to your Savior because God has come to save you. Amen. 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 And so lots of times it looks like we're in this hopeless situation, but when you have him, there is no hopeless situation. When you have him, there's nothing that is impossible. For the word of God says all things. How many things? All. All things are possible to who? To whom? Him who believes. And so what do we have to do? We just have to believe that he's going to save us. Amen. He did save us, and he's going to continue to save us. doesn't matter what doctor's report you get, God will save you. doesn't matter what your job says, God will save you. doesn't matter what's going on in the world, God will save you. And don't you know we need to have a revelation of the saving power of Jesus Christ as we live in today's society? Come on, you need to know him as protector. You need to know him as deliverer. You need to know him as savior. 
Why? Because when you do, he'll save you from every situation. Glory to God. Did you know nothing catches him by surprise? Your family situation right now has not surprised God. Amen. Nothing catches him by surprise. And so since nothing catches him by surprise, he's already made a way for you. How do we do that? We trust in him. How do we get through that? And then and walk in the way he has for us by trusting in him. See, God has come to save me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my song. Woo, he has given me victory. Hallelujah. When you trust in God, he becomes your strength. He be, what song are you singing? Amen. He becomes your song. Amen. He's your strength. He's your song. And that leads to victory. You know, I used to could listen to country music. I don't know why. I just, I liked it. Hallelujah. And they, you know, they say if you play a country song backwards, you get everything back. <laughs> you get your dog back. You get your wife or girlfriend back. You get your car back. Hallelujah. And so, you know, I used to sing all those songs that come on the radio. I had two box sets in my truck. I had the Garth Brooks box set and the Tupac box set. Yeah. It don't get any more diverse than that, baby. <laughs> Hallelujah. And those were the box sets that I had in my truck. And I listened, you know, just me against the world. Yo, no, yo mama. And then I got Garth Brooks and the thunder rolls. <laughs> And the lightning strike, you know, and it's just like, what are you doing with your life, baby? I don't know. And we'd sing all those songs, and most of the time, you know, it's songs about, you know, how, how dark it is and how gross it is and how much of a struggle it is. And I'd start singing those songs and then start wondering, why am I struggling? <laughs> what song are you singing? Is it the song of the Lord and the song of victory? Yeah. Hallelujah. Or is it a song of death and defeat? See, when you trust in him, you sing a different song. Because everything you look at now has got hope in it. Everything you look at it, man, now it's got victory in it. And so your song changes just a little bit as you trust in God. Because things aren't the same anymore. You've got something that's made it different. <laughs> Woo! You've got something that's the power of God, and it'll change every circumstance. It'll change every situation. Amen. It'll make a way where it looks like there's no way. Amen. It'll bless you when it looks like you're cursed. It'll give you laughs when it looks like there's death. It'll heal you when it looks like you're sick because his song is a song of salvation. As we've learned over the years from Reverend Opal and Healing School, that, so that word save is sozo. It's all inclusive. That means he takes care of everything. Hallelujah. So we start singing that song. Psalms 37, 5 says, commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do it. Trust in him and he will do it. Someone say, I trust in the Lord. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Do not be impressed with your own wisdom. Did you know we're not as smart as we think we are? <laughs> Glory to God. Pastor Rhonda, she shares this revelation. She said the greatest revelation, I remember who the minister she heard it from was, that the greatest revelation she ever heard was, uh, God is smarter than I am. Hallelujah. And that's a great revelation because guess what? His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are deeper than your thoughts. That doesn't mean we can't know his ways and can't know his thoughts. It just means they're deeper than ours. Amen. His way is better than Robert's way. And so I've got to not lean on my own understanding, which isn't that great anyways. And I've got to depend on, rely on, and trust in the one that has made a way for me. Listen, we can't do that by leaning on our own understanding. The Bible says he'll use the foolish things to confound the wise. What makes sense up here don't always make sense in here. And so as believers and as Christians in this body of Christ, we have to make a decision. Which one are we going to follow? Are we going to follow the soul or are we going to follow the spirit? What is your soul? It's your mind, your will, and your emotions. And hallelujah, most of us know our mind and our will and our emotions, they be back crazy. And so when we follow our mind, and our, maybe it's just me, hallelujah, but my mind, my will, and my emotions, they're like this. That roller coaster at Six Flags. One day it's up, one day it's down. One day it's up, one day it's down. One day it's scary, I feel like I'm going to die. The other day it's like, ah, let's go, you know. That's my mind, my will, and my emotions, but my spirit's always up here. 
And that's why when we are led of the Spirit and we rely on the Spirit and we trust in the Holy Spirit, our lives will always be up here. Because now we're no longer living on the roller coaster of our soul. We're living in the consistency of God. What is the consistency of God? He is good all the time. Every good and what? Perfect gift comes down from him. John 10.10 says that he's come to give life and to give it to us in what? Abundance. What is that? That's living up here. And so we've got to trust in him and not lean on our own understanding. Amen. Receiving the promise means putting the emotions of the moment to the side and trusting in God. Did y'all catch that? Receiving the promise means putting the emotions of the moment to the side and trusting in God. Do you know when things happen in our lives, it creates a lot of emotions? And what are emotions? They're not bad. God created them, so they're good. But if we let them, they'll dictate how we feel in the moment. And if you live by your emotions, you're not going to live in victory. Because every report you get is not a victory report. Every bill you get is not a victory bill. Amen. Every situation you walk into isn't just overshadowed and overwhelmed with victory. And so we have to learn, hallelujah, to put the emotions of the moment to the side so we can trust in God. Because i got to tell you, we're usually trusting one or the other. We're either leaning on our own understanding, we're either trusting in our soul, or we're trusting in God. And only one of those leads to the promise. You remember over in 2 Chronicles 20, 21, when the great army had risen up against them and God, uh, whoever the king was, it Joab or Moab or one of the abs, went and sought the Lord and he said, put the praise and worship team out front. And the praise and worship team was like, yo, Jesus, hallelujah. And they just went out there and they started praising God. And we know that they won a great victory. What did they have to do? Put the emotions of the moment to the side. Don't you know when you're running, hallelujah, at a bunch of people with swords, knives, daggers, and fire, and all you got is a song, there's some emotions in that moment. And those emotions don't look like, don't feel like, don't smell like victory. But if you'll put the emotions to the side and run at your challenge with God, mm, I'll just say it again. Hallelujah. If you put the emotions to the side and run at your challenge with God, Amen. Then you'll overcome the challenge. Why? Because as we trust in him, we have victory every time. You remember David over there in Samuel, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 17, one of those books. Hallelujah. And the great, uh, the giant Goliath had come against the armies of God. And you know what? This is so interesting. What's interesting about David, talking about not being ruled and governed by your emotions, David's family wasn't with him. David's king wasn't with him. And then he had a warrior that definitely wasn't with him. And so he's got it coming at him at every front. You ever felt like your family's not with you? You ever feel like the leader of whatever company or whatever, uh, you know, is not with you? You ever feel like there's a bunch of things that have come against you? So what do you do? You put all that to the side and you trust in God. Because when you trust in God, amen, it leads to victory. We know the story that David went out there with his slingshot and his stone, and he killed Goliath on that day. He took his own sword and cut off his head and held it up for everybody to see. Why? So that they would know that there was a God. Amen. Everyone say, I'm putting the emotions to the side. Because when we do, there's great victory. Mark 5, 35 and 36, it says, while Jesus was still speaking to her. So this is the, the, the biblical account of the woman with the issue of blood. And we know Jesus was walking. The Bible says there's a great multitude, hallelujah. And that they were, uh, you know, there were so many people around him. But then somebody touched the hem of his garment with the touch of faith. And as she touched the hem of his garment with the touch of faith, power came out of him. That word dunamis came out of him. And Jesus recognized it. Hallelujah. Does Jesus recognize when you touch him? And Jesus recognized, and so he stopped, and he said, virtue or power had come out of me. Who touched my garment? And the disciples were like, Jesus, you crazy. Everybody's touching you. Look around. This is a great multitude. And Jesus was like, no, you don't understand. Power came out of me. Who touched me? And then this woman, because she was a little scared of her situation, she wasn't supposed to be out in public because she was a disease, and she was out there, and she stands up, and she said, I touched you, Lord. And he looks at her and says, your faith has made you whole. And then all the time this is going on, and Jesus is interacting, having a conversation with her, there's this other dude around him named Jairus. 
And Jairus is standing there, and it brings us to this portion of the scripture right here in 35, 36. It says, while he was still speaking to her, who's he? That's Jesus speaking to the woman with the issue of blood. A messenger arrived from Jairus' home, the leader of the synagogue. And they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus, someone say, but Jesus. Hallelujah. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. One translation says this, don't be afraid, just trust. Jairus had to decide, am I going to trust in my emotions? Am I going to trust in my situation? Or am I going to trust in Jesus? See, because we put our faith in one report or the other. Amen. We believe one report. You go back to Numbers chapter 13. When he sent out the spies and they came back and some of them had an evil report and two of them had a good report, the congregation as a whole put their faith, their belief in the evil report and it kept them out of the promised land. See, which report do you believe in? I'll believe the report of the Lord. And so Jairus has a decision to make. He says, don't be afraid, just have faith. Hallelujah. In my Bible, it says, just trust. He had to decide what he was going to do. And so we know what Jairus' decision was. He decided to trust in Jesus. How do we know? Because faith has corresponding actions. The next thing you know, they're walking to Jairus' house. He believed Jesus could heal his daughter. And we saw that through corresponding actions. Then the next part in Mark 5, 37, it says, then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. Woo, I love this. If you're going to trust in Jesus, you got to separate yourself. Because there's a whole lot of people that don't want you trusting in him. And Jesus recognized this. He recognized Jairus has chosen to trust in me. He has chosen to believe in the report of the Lord. He has decided to put his trust in me. Someone say, trust in me. And so Jesus recognized that. And he said, let's go to your house. But on the way to this house, Jesus said, I'm not going to let anybody take you out of faith. I'm not going to let any, you've decided to trust in me. I'm going to protect that. And the way I'm going to protect it is I'm going to get rid of everybody that might pull you out of trust or faith. See, you look up that word right there, trust, and it means actually to entrust. What does entrust mean? It means that you're relying on someone to perform something. Jairus was relying on Jesus to perform something, a miracle in his daughter's life. And Jesus wasn't going to let anybody or anything stop that from happening. So he separated, amen. Mark 5, or, uh, it's over here in Psalms, chapter 1, verse 1. Y'all doing all right this morning? Amen. Glory to God. He says, blessed is the one who does not walk in the steps of the wicked or stand in the way of the sinners or take a seat with the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. What's he talking about here in Psalms, verse 1? As he goes on, he says, if you'll do this, you'll be like trees planted by waters and you'll grow. What's he talking about? He's talking about separation. Don't sit. In the, what, let's just read. Let's slow down. Everyone take a deep breath. See, because I get looking at that clock and I feel like I, I got to go. I got to go. <laughs> and then when I got to go, I get to going. And then all of you come up to me afterwards and like, that was great, but I couldn't understand. <laughs> Do you understand what you just said to me? <laughs> And then I feel like, you know, that movie, Billy Madison, if everyone's ever seen it before, when he's trying to learn Spanish and the guy riddles off in Spanish and then he looks at him and he goes, slow down. (laughs) I feel that from you right now. (laughs) Slow down. And so I'm trying. Hallelujah. And so we're going to, everyone take a deep breath again. (sighs) Slow down. Psalms 1, (laughs) verses 1 through 3. Petty, so petty. (laughs) Blessed is the one, listen to this, blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way of the sinners or take seat in the company of mockers. Blessed is the one who does not do these things. Guess what? It is your decision to not do those things. It is your decision to separate to say, okay, in order to trust God, I'm going to have to separate, even, and this is personal decisions, I'm going to have to separate my life from the steps of the wicked. I'm going to have to, step, and that's not even talking about other people, separating your life from the steps of the wicked. I'm going to separate myself from the steps of the wicked. What does that mean? I'm not going to do this, but I'm going to walk this way because this way is trusting in him. Remember what he said in Proverbs 3, is you trust in him, he'll show you the path to take. It's good preaching, Amen. 
not, or stand in the way of the sinners or take a seat at the company of mockers, but whose delight in the law of the Lord and who meditates in the law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields fruit in seasons and whole, whose leaves do not wither. Whatever they do prospers. I don't know about you, but I want everything I do to prosper. I want my job to prosper. I want my ministry to prosper. I want my family to prosper. I want my country to prosper. I want my church to prosper. I want you to prosper. And in order for that to happen, I've got to separate from some things, and I've got to trust in him. I've got to get away from my understanding, from my insight, from my wisdom, and I've got to get over into his understanding, his insight, and his window, wisdom so I can trust in him. So I can be like a tree that produces fruit in every season and my leaves never wither, but instead everything I do prospers. I want to say I trust in him. Mark 5, 38 through 42, finishing out this story or this biblical example, it says, When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, Why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. And the crowd laughed at him. Well, you know, if you study uh, Eastern civilization, you'll understand that there were professional weepers back in the day. When something bad happened in your life, they didn't have any connection or emotion to you. They just weeped because it was their job. And this was their job to weep. How do I know that these were professional weepers? Because when Jesus said she's not dead, she's only sleeping, they laughed. You could say it this way, they were fake. And so what did Jesus do? Well, he says... Uh, the crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave. He got rid of the fake people. See, I don't want fake people in my life. Woo. Woo. I don't want fake people in my life that say they got my back, but they don't really got my back. Well, how do I get the real people in my life? By trusting him. See, my life before Jesus had a bunch of imitations People that said they're with me, but when the stuff hit the fan, they're not really with you. I want people who are really with me. And so Jesus recognized they weren't really with them, so what did he do? He kicked them all out and left the people in the room that were really with him. You know, we learn through the scriptures that it's not the, the quantity of friends you have, but it's the quality of friends you have. Scriptures teach us that all through the word, and lots of times we think it's only youth ministry stuff, but that's life stuff. It says that bad company corrupts good morals. Right? You go over there and you look, remember those four men that took that paralyzed man and they opened up the roof and they dropped him down in front of Jesus and Jesus healed that man? Man, aren't you glad that that, I bet you that paralyzed man was real happy that he had some friends that weren't going to abandon him. You know, they look at his little, his condition and they say, you're in bad shape, bro, we're going to see Jesus, peace out. No, they put him on a gurney, they grabbed that gurney and they walked to the house where Jesus was. What is that? That's having their back. Amen, that's real commitment and dedication. Woo, we're going a whole different way right now, praise God, but it's good. And so lots of times, if our situation's not getting any better, maybe we need to look at our fellowship. Mm. All right. Holding her hand, he said to her, that Greek word right there, Talitha Keum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. There's no situation that's too big for him. No impossibility. All things are possible. Amen. But it takes somebody to trust. See, Jairus trusted in Jesus and trusted in the power and trusted in his deity and trusted in his ability. Trusted in his anointing. And so he didn't listen to the crowd. He didn't listen to the messenger. He listened to Jesus alone, brought Jesus to his house. As Jim was just talking about, there's no Uber, hallelujah. They got to walk or ride a donkey, and so it may take a minute to get where they're going. And the whole time he was doing it, he was believing in Jesus, trusting in Jesus. When we trust in Jesus, we get victory every time. Someone say every time. Amen. Did you know to trust in God is to trust in the word? Somebody's saying, well, I don't know how to trust in him. It's easy. You trust in the word. Trusting in God is trusting in the word. Let's look at a, a familiar example of this real quick. John 20, 24 through 25, it says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was with the disciples when Jesus, or was not with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger into the nail, where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. 
Now, we know a lot about Doubt and Thomas because you've heard him taught about, but this is so interesting. And as I was studying and praying, it's amazing how God gives you just little bits of revelation. And a lot of you probably already know this, but it came alive to me as I was reading this. Thomas was not doubting in what the disciples were saying. He was doubting in what Jesus had said. See, I always read it, you know, if your friend tells you something, you may believe it, you may not believe it. And so the other 12 disciples came and said, dude, we saw Jesus, it was awesome. And he's like, yeah, right, you're trolling. And he says, unless I see his hands and his side, I'm not going to believe it. But he wasn't doubting what his friends were saying. He wasn't doubting their word, he was doubting the word. And why was he doubting the word? Because if you go over to John chapter 2, verse 18, and it says the Jews responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered to them. He said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. See, the, 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 the disciples were simply echoing what Jesus had already spoken. And so Thomas wasn't doubting in their word. He was doubting in the word. See, when we esteem the word, we esteem Jesus. And in order to believe in Jesus, you got to believe in the word. Now listen to the rest of this. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and so you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, listen, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. See, in order to put your faith in him, you must remember the words that he's spoken and put your faith and your confidence in the scriptures. Trusting in the word is trusting in Jesus. Someone say, I trust the word. You go over to Matthew chapter 14, verses 20 through 25. This is where Peter gets out of the boat. You remember Jesus walking on the water? How cool is that? I mean, Jesus walking on water. That's amazing. I, I remember when I was young in the Lord and I just got born again and really pursuing him. I tried this at every pool I went to. This is no lie. <laughs> tried that walking on the water business. We even cheated a little bit. How do you, we put rafts across it. I still couldn't make it. But Jesus is out there walking on the water. And then you've got Peter, one who's bold enough to believe bold enough to trust in. And he looks out at him, he says, Jesus, if that's really you, bid me to come. And Jesus looks back and it says, it is me, Peter, come. And I love, I heard Pastor Mark teach this, I don't know, 17 years since I've been here. And when Pastor Mark said this, I, the, the very first time, it just really got me in my heart. He said, Peter wasn't walking on the water, he was walking on the word. What was that word? Peter, come. See, Peter trusted in Jesus and trusted in the word of Jesus. He trusted in that word, just one word, come. And he trusted in that word so much so that it empowered him to get out of the boat and walk on the water. Something that's impossible became possible because somebody trusted in the word of Jesus. Someone say, I'll trust the word. Why do we trust the word? Well, over in John verses 1, Chapter, five, verse, chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. See, when you trust in the Word, darkness cannot overcome it. Why? Why? Because trusting in the word is trusting in Jesus.